views expressed on this program are those of the hosts, guests, and callers, and are not necessarily those of this station, its management, or other advertisers. You're listening to Transformation Talk Radio. Welcome to Cultural Brilliance Radio, the DNA of organizational excellence with Claudette Rowley. Conversations that are transforming the world of culture and business. Claudette brings fresh, innovative perspectives that push the boundaries of what organizational cultures can and should be. Learn how to catalyze your organization's workforce into an authentic, intentional, and financially successful culture. Now here's your host, Claudette Rowley. Hey, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's so great to have all of you tune us in and turn us on. Uh, This is a really seriously important day for a lot of reasons, but most importantly, because I get to share this day with Claudette Rowley. She is the author of the book, Cultural Brilliance. And what we're talking about here today, not, not only is it about this incredible book, But it's about the journey and how each of us takes a step as we move forward in our lives. When we say yes to our passion, to our purpose, but more importantly, than the action that it takes. And so I've had the honor and uh, pleasure of working with Claudette as the notion of cultural brilliance became a concept, then became a construct, then became a way to really work in organizations, honor the people that are there change the cultures, and at the same time, do it where it honors the dignity of the human spirit. That's what this book begins on. It is is the kind of book that if you're someone like me that has spent most of my life in corporate America and then in a field of organizational development and organizational psychology, and then go on to study the dynamics and organization between people, what you realize is as you look at the ever-changing landscape, it was time for a new narrative on organizational culture, culture. It was time for someone to come along and say, yes, we honor all of the work that has been done before on culture. And by the way, It's time to talk about brilliant cultures. It's time to talk about the most dynamic nature in culture, whether it's a big organization, a small organization, a group, it doesn't matter. What Claudette has put together is a blueprint for how to look at engaging people in today's dynamic workplace whether it is an in-office suite or you're working with people around the world, to take a look at how each and every person gets to contribute to the integrity of the organization, to the dynamics of the organization, to the respect in organizations, and in the end, to the bottom line results. And so now here we are talking about, and today is the launch of this incredible book, which I am so thrilled to be talking with all of you about cultural brilliance, the DNA of excellence. Claudette Rowley has done it. And here it is. Claudette, thanks, it's Pat. great to have you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much. I'm really thrilled to be here, especially on this big day, the launch day. Yeah. The launch day. When you woke up this morning, did it dawn on you that today was the launch day of the book? Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Um, look, there is um, there, there are many things I've just said, but one of the things that I'm really struck by in having worked with you on the book and watched what you created here is the fact that there was a clear need to write something, to outline something, to create a system so that organizations can look at not just what's not worked in the past, but what it really means, what it takes 
to take a look at people in the organization and consider who they are as individuals, yet at the same time, build a culture of excellence. Mm-hmm. I want to ask you this question. All along the way, as you took this on and you wrote the book, what is it about you and your own practice? How have you changed in defining this, writing this, and then using it? How have I changed? Um, I think it's really, it's an interesting question, and I actually haven't thought about it. So you get a very uh, top of the head response. <laughs> How have I changed? I think it's it's this book for me at a very personal level uh, is the representation of my at least at this point, my full potential. Like I felt that I wrote something that was commensurate with what I have to offer the world. And that's really exciting to me. Um, And that I was able to work with you and and so many other supporters to help me bring it out into the world. So the idea lost. Um, And I also think I got really lucky because of timing, because I, I wrote this and I'm launching this at a time when we're all talking about culture. So five years ago, we weren't talking about culture as much. And these books, a book on culture is much harder to put out when people aren't talking about it. So I also got lucky with timing. Um, But I think it's, yeah, the change piece has really been, it's just exciting to be, to put something out into the world and to have stretched enough to do it. Um, As a friend of mine said this morning, was uh, having a a conversation where she was just supporting me at the beginning of the day, because it's such a big day. And she said, remember, this is not easy to do. Like you've done something significant. And that was a great reminder, you know, that it, it takes a lot of stretching to write a book and then, put it out into the world. Yeah. Well, it does take a lot of stretching. And yet at the same time, the process is kind of amazing to see how it all comes together. Mm -hmm. Um, Let's talk about what the book, Cultural Brilliance, the DNA of Organizational Lexons, what is this book stand for? And what I mean by that is, I mean that here we are talking about culture. And culture is a word now that I think you said it where we've been watching over the past two to three years, conversations about culture, but large part of the time, we're not really talking about the essence in culture, mm-hmm. especially in organizations. We talk, uh, we talk about it as if, oh, like that's a thing, but then there are people. Yeah. I want you to just talk about what is your traditional dialogue about culture and then what is a brilliant culture? How do they compare? Yeah. The traditional dialogue about culture, and, and again, this is in fairness, is changing. You know, as people, there's I think a range of conversations right now about culture, but the traditional dialogue was much more how things are done around here, right? And it was at a cert, much more of a surface level. Um, or it'd be when we talk, you'd ask a company or an organization about their culture, they'd talk about their annual holiday, their social events, which are part of culture and very important. Now we're hearing when people talk about culture, especially when they know a little bit really is it's a deeper conversation and understanding how it's about it's about behaviors right it's about beliefs and norms and people who have researched shine dr gershine and others for a long time already knew that and talked a lot about it but it wasn't part of the average organizational conversation i think brilliant so i you know building on a lot of brilliant cultures build on a lot of other people's work Uh, but when brilliant cultures. We're certainly talking about the day-to-day of what it's like to work in an organization, but we're bringing a higher level of consciousness and intention to it. And we're viewing culture as something that actually helps the organization move into excellence. And like you were saying, culture is not this thing that we put, is this extra thing that we lay over the company. There is no culture without people, obvious statement, but believe it, the dots are not always connected in dialogue on culture around that just like we have no organization without people. So people and culture are almost synonymous in a way, you know, a group of people and culture. I mean, it's, it's pretty much the same thing. Yeah. You know, let's, uh, one of the things too, we're going to talk about today is we're going to take a walk through the book and mm-hmm. we're going to take a walk at, you know, what some of the signs are, what some of the most important things we should know about. You know, let me ask you this question. Um, I think one of the things that that I, I'm really struck by is if you talk to the people in the organization and can actually get them to openly talk about what their work experience, what it's like, yeah. you can find out a lot about cultures. But mm-hmm. a lot of times, Claudette, people won't speak up. How do you address this in the book, Cultural Brilliance? I, I talk about creating something called a cultural safety zone. Um, and it, it really is about 
consciously and intentionally taking a group of people through a process of saying, how are we going to talk about our culture safely, right? What are our ground rules? And having that conversation, and that's pretty traditional organizational development work that you want to create safety, but I wanted to call it something specific, like a cultural safety zone, give it a title. So it, so people, we actually need to make this as safe as possible before we sit down. Like, are, are we going to make sure conversations are confidential or not? How is this information going to be used? That's a huge concern people have. They don't want something to come back and stab them in the back, you know, if they had the courage to tell the truth. So it's really getting intentional and creative about designing how you're going to interact and talk about your culture, which is really the first step. And when we get people to open up and actually talk about it in a safe way, you learn a tremendous amount. They learn a tremendous amount. And it's interesting because then there's another layer underneath that actually nobody really knows about. That's often where I, I get more involved in helping them understand some of the beliefs that nobody, no, they could talk for 10 hours and they're not going to come come upon it probably because it's just too, um, those types of beliefs tend to be something nobody talks about. So no one's really aware of them, but they're fascinating, at least to me, because they tend to drive what a lot of people are doing. Well, you, mm-hmm. you know, one of the things we'll talk about when we come back too is we're going to take a look at what this means to really step forward and commit to understanding and then creating a brilliant culture. When we come back, we're going to be talking with Claudette about what does this mean? What is an authentic culture? And as we look at the absolutely phenomenal way that Claudette has laid this out, what is it about us as leaders? Mm -hmm. What is it that we do? What are the potholes we step into that if we could only be more aware of, it would create an enormous shift. Claudette mm-hmm. Rally is in the house. We are very thrilled to be celebrating today the book launch of her book, Brilliance. When we come back, we'll let you know how you can get a copy of the book. Also, great things that people are offering for those of you out there ready to hit the adaptogen button. We'll be right back. really excited about today. Today is the book launch. And it's the book launch for uh, for Claudette. But more importantly, it really is amazing to see what happens when you have a dream. And then you take action towards the dream. Now, it's not always that linear. It's not always quite like that. But in this case, I've gotten to sit side by side and see exactly you know, what Claudette was passionate about, what she's doing. And as a result, we now have an incredible book, Cultural Brilliance, the DNA of Organizational Excellence. Claudette, today is the day. How can people get their copy of the book? Thanks, Pat. They can go right to my website, culturalbrilliance.com and click on the book link at the top. And since this is launch day, if you order through the website, you get lots and lots and lots of great extra bonus gifts. So, and I know Dr. Pat, you have, you have a gift, right? Included. Thank you so much yeah, in the yeah. launch. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's an exciting day. We're already in one category in Amazon bestseller, which I was thrilled with. That was my goal. By the time we got on the show, oh. I'd be a bestseller in one category. Yep. Mm-hmm. Wow. So, yeah. Congratulations. And it's Thank still you. early yet, right? I know. I know. It's exciting. <laughs> Well, I mean, and, and this is a book and because I think the concept is a concept that's not only timely, but it absolutely needs to be addressed. Look, we have now seen statistics coming out about everything from workplace bullying to uh, instances of respect, disrespect, not honoring people. I mean, you know, we've now started to gather this information up, but yet it's always been the same old narrative about it. And mm-hmm. it falls under the guise of climate, but it really doesn't. And Mm -hmm. so today what we're talking about is a bigger issue, but not one that just we're going to chit chat about it. You've actually designed Mm -hmm. a way to work in organizations to create it. Uh, Here's the question. I want to ask you about what you've seen, right, from leaders in organizations. 
Why has it been so hard for them to assess actually what's going on? And what are some of the common things that happen in the workplace to give you signs that, uh uh-oh, this culture is in trouble? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) What are those signs? Yeah. Uh, I I think one of the reasons it's hard to assess culture is because part of it is, is, is under, is underground and underwater, right? There are things going on that make up culture, create a culture over time that nobody's probably ever talked about, right? A set of beliefs or norms for behavior. And so those kinds of things are harder to assess. Um, And I think for leaders, one of the things that I talk to leaders about is being willing to really listen, which I know sounds basic, but listen to what they're hearing, which is huge. So not what they wanted to hear or hope to hear. The other thing I noticed that for some leaders gets in their way, and this is usually a blind spot, is they, they will, I'll give them some information or feedback and they'll say, well, that this should be different. Well, I'm sure that it should be different, but it is not different. And, and really starting to have that conversation about this is the reality and I'm sure it should be different. I'm sure you're right. And this isn't, that's not what, what is happening here. So things should be more efficient. I'm sure they should be more efficient and yet they're not. So what do we do about it? And ha- starting to have those kinds of conversations and break it down so that we can, because what I find is when organizations get in real conversations, but, and by that I mean they're telling the truth, but it's respectful, it's heartfelt, it's honest about their experiences, you can solve tons and tons of problems actually pretty easily when you can get down to that level of dialogue. So that that is a huge piece of it. Yeah. I, I mean, what you're yeah. talking about is, for a, for a lot of people, mm-hmm. what they say is, I'm not quite sure how to get there. Mm-hmm. And that's where you come in. Because this is literally uh, an outline in the book, Cultural Brilliance. This is an outline of even if this is where you are, Mm -hmm. this is where you can get to. You can become a brilliant culture. Let's talk about the dynamic of that. You have found that there are three core elements in the Mm -hmm. system, but then there are all these other interactions of things that have to go on. Describe the cultural brilliance system. And as you see it, Mm -hmm. what are some of the nuances, the creative elements that you've now brought to play that no one's really addressed before to to, to really speak honestly about it? They haven't really addressed it in today's world. Hmm. Yeah, thanks. So it's happy to be able to to talk about it. I'm, you know, so excited. It's the bulk of the book um, is is the system. I wanted to create something that people could take and, and use, right? So they could read this book if they wanted and say, you know, we can take five ideas from this and apply it, right? So it's not just a high concept book, a conceptual book. It's also, it has a step-by-step process in it, which is the cultural brilliant system. And the first step is authenticity. And that's really about understanding how your culture really operates um, because we can't change what we don't understand. I was in an organization recently where someone also said, um, I can't change what I don't know about. And he was really angry because he was getting feedback about three months too late about something. And he said, how could I change? How could, how could I change something I don't even know about? Why didn't you tell me? And I bring up that example because it's off, you know, in, when we're working toward having a more brilliant culture, that's really important that people need feedback on time. Um, it, it's a key, it's a key complaint. So really, how does your, at the heart of culture, you know, how does, you know, how does it really operate? And then we, we then I created something called the contextual emergence transition. And all that really means is now that we've uncovered all this information about our culture, what we like, what we don't like, what we need, what we don't need, how are we going to decide what we want to bring forward with us? Like if this is a journey, what are we what you know, what are we taking with us and what are we leaving behind? And that's where we really start to understand, you know, where the culture is really brilliant and where it's getting blocked. Um, and so that's a little nuance there uh, that I put in place. It's a transition point. Uh, and then we move into adaptogen design, right? Um, and I always have to give you credit for this, Dr. Pat, <laughs> use of the word adaptogen. And adaptogens, for those who aren't familiar, because I wasn't up until several months ago, are herbal substances like maca or ginseng that help the body regulate um, regulate its system and bring it back to health. So Dr. Pat challenged me to apply that to culture. <laughs> so I applied it to the design um, and called it adaptogen design. And this is really how we say, how do we create, how do we actually design a culture at a functional level that will move us from where we are right now as a culture to where we want to be, right? A more brilliant version of our culture. Do it in a way so we can adapt to change more easily. We can 
uh, decrease our stress, inspire overall learning in the organization. And all of that hits the bottom line of business results. So it's, it's all tied into where you want to go to strategically as a company and an organization. Uh, then once the organization has a design in place for their culture, we actually test it out. We, we prototype it. We, we try it out with a team, a department, a couple of departments, whatever makes sense. And that's called uh, the design integrity transition. So it's really saying, what's the, is the integrity of this design hold? Does this really work, right? Just because it looks good on paper does not mean, and I know this from a lot of experience, it's going to work in real life with people. So we have to try it out. We get feedback. And then we go into the implementation phase, which is also called integration, right? So we're integrating this design into the organization and the culture. And all of this is done, because I haven't mentioned this, with tons of involvement from people in the organization, from all different levels, from all different areas and departments. So we bring, we bring as many people as possible into the involvement of this, because they, they're giving then a really holistic, a 360 viewpoint on how this works, their experience of the culture, how these designs work, how these prototypes work. And then once we've integrated it, we, we go back, it's called the social capital transition. And that's a nuance, a transition where we really say, so now that you've implemented this cultural change and you've been, you've had it in place for six months, let's say, how is it working, right? How is this really working? What have you learned? What's changed? What hasn't? How have your business results improved, et cetera? Um, and then go from there. So that is the process in a nutshell. It is. It is. And the thing that I love about this, and I just want to give people a little snapshot of this for a minute, if we could, mm -hmm. because there's something really interesting about this. And, and, and one of the things I want to point to immediately is something that you say, and this is, this is, this is it in a nutshell. You say that you wrote the book, Cultural mm -hmm. Brilliance, the DNA of Organizational Excellence, because you, want, you believe the business world is uniquely positioned to help us choose the path of human connection yeah. dignity, and abundance. This path doesn't sacrifice profitability, revenue generation, or innovation. And that, to me, is one of the key elements that you point to over and over and over and over again throughout the book mm -hmm. to remind the reader, to remind the the leaders of organizations to remind the employees that this book isn't just for the top 1% of the organization. It's for yeah. people that want to understand what's going on in their workplace, how to anticipate and how to implement change. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is what we're talking about. And it's a very different conversation uh, that I believe about culture because it does bring in another element of it. Mm -hmm. And that is what we refer to as climate. So the minute we use the word dignity and respect, now what you've done in this book and in your work, you've said, we're not just going to talk about this thing that it's hard to wrap our minds around, but we're going to talk about people and how they respond and how they react. And in the end, folks, these are the folks that you want to really understand this and be mm -hmm. motivated to perform. Mm -hmm. That aspect of the book and your body of work, that's what's really, really different. Mm. Do you believe, do you believe that in the world we live in today, that this book is going to cross over between leaders and employees? I would, I would hope so. I mean, that, that would be that would feel very successful, you know, to me as a contribution, we, you know, leaders need, leaders need to be on board with cultural change. And I think it, it, you know, I feel really bad when I talking with someone in an organization who's not at an official leadership level, who's really frustrated about the culture and wants to change it. Right. And they just, I can give them tips. I can give them strategies. Right. I can give them advice, but they're probably going to hit a wall. It's going to be challenging um, unless they're in a rare organization. And it doesn't mean people shouldn't try, but they, you do need to have the leaders on board. And at the same time, you know, for someone to say, hey, I heard about this book and they bring it to their, their leader or the CEO or whatever and say, would you be willing to talk, read this through or flip through it and see if you'd be interested in it? And that person says, yeah, sure. I, I always want to improve our culture. I'll take a look at this. Thanks for bringing it to my attention. That's the kind of thing we're hoping for, right? Is that anybody in an organization can pick this up or they can, they can read it and maybe they lead a team of 10 people and they apply it to their team first and see, you know, how the principles in the book help them, you know, help the team out. So yeah, my, my vision is certainly that anybody can pick this up um, yeah. and find a way to use it 
that's, that brings more brilliance into their workplace, you know, into their lives. Absolutely. Well, you know, one of the things I love about it, and I'm reading about what folks are now saying about the book um, and touch on the depth and the breadth of what you've created, right? Mm -hmm. um, let's take a short break. When we come back, I want to talk with you about the notion of a new narrative. Mm -hmm. And what exactly do we mean by the DNA of organizational excellence? That's a whole fun conversation. Claudette Rowley's in the house. We're going to tell you when we come back how to get a copy of the book. But you can go to the culturalbrilliance.com right there. Click on the book picture and you will be able to buy your copy of the book as we celebrate not mm. only a new narrative, but what I call some amazing ways for people in the workplace to create their own narrative on excellence. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone. Claudette Rowley's in the house. We're very excited. Today is the launch of her fantastic book, Cultural Brilliance, the DNA of Organizational Excellence. Uh, for those of you out there that want to find out more about Claudette, that want to find out more about her book, uh, but also you're probably thinking, wait a minute, I would love for her to come in and talk with us in our organization. And what I want to say is this book, because a lot of times we get books like this, and they really are for a particular type of organization. This book is not. Mm -hmm. This book is for organizations, big or small, you know, locally or internationally, mm -hmm. uh, leadership model, employee model, it doesn't matter. When we're talking about organizational excellence, we're talking about people. And so that makes this cultural brilliance a universal construct, a universal idea cultural mm -hmm. brilliance. Um, how can folks find out more about that? And Claudia, how can people get a hold of you directly? Thanks. Um, the website is culturalbrilliance.com. So that's a great place to find, to buy the book, to find out more about the book, um, a little bit about my background. My email is Claudia at culturalbrilliance.com. So I'm happy to, you know, there's also a contact form on the site. Hear from anybody, answer questions, talk about coaching, speaking, consulting, how I can be helpful, anything. Thanks. I love it. Yeah, I love it. Well, congratulations. Thank you. About the book, about, shall I say, uh, uh, a, a best selling book. Let's just say that. But yeah. we're, we're still fired up. We're really out there, more reaching more people, taking the message out there. But one of the things I'm struck by, and I know you must have been asked a lot of questions about, is this idea of DNA, mm. DNA of organizational excellence. Mm -hmm. See, I love that because mm -hmm. when I think about that, you know, I think sometimes we have forgotten that innate or inherent to us as human beings is this brilliance system and mm -hmm. energy, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And yet something happens at the workplace. Does this phrase, the DNA of organizational excellence, truly change the narrative? Because, I mean, it does. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because one of the things I talk about in the book is that culture operates as a system. In fact, I instead of saying culture or through a lot of the book, I say cultural system to reinforce the point. And I think when we talk about DNA, we're really, if we can change the system of an organization, which involves how people think, right, their mindset, their behavior, other structures and systems, and we can change all of that in a conscious and intentional way, you are changing the actual DNA of the organization. And I think I think culture really is the DNA of the organization. And when we go back, you know, we look at historical culture, right? We can peel, we go back and look at a company's inception or the last couple of decades or the last five years, however long it's been around. And we look at the key events, you can see how the culture is built over time. So historical culture like DNA does, does really, the past does impact the present and, and our potential future. But the nice thing about culture is we actually have um, more of an opportunity to intervene. We can change how the system operates. Right. We can change how people interact. We can bring things to the forefront and say, is this really how we want to treat each other? Do we really want to be this disrespectful? 
Do you want to stab each other in the back? Or do we want to have a psychologically safe environment where people feel that they can bring their best ideas forward, that they can share that they've made a mistake, and we can all learn from it? You know, just even in those two ex very small examples, you have an extremely different culture and an extremely different DNA that you're setting the stage for. Yeah. I mean, it really is, you know, akin to any fear-based culture where yeah. when we're operating in a fear-based culture or um, let's say you don't feel safe, an unsafe culture, um, everything that gets presented uh, is a partial representation mm -hmm. of what the potentiality might be for any right. idea, you know, any mindset, any behavioral change, just about anything. And so uh, let me ask you this question. As you were looking at this and saying, I just don't want to write a book. I want to really design something, a system, you know, that is on strategy, but doesn't get us so deep down into the weeds. We forget about the system at play here. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I, I was struck by, and I want to grab onto it and ask you about it. Mm -hmm. is one of the most used words in organizations, but the least understood, mm -hmm. integrity. Mm -hmm. I, I want to ask you about this because mm -hmm. it looks like the way you've outlined authenticity and so forth, right? That there's something about integrity here that is important in the way you describe organizational change. Can you talk mm -hmm. to that? Sure, absolutely. The integrity, I mean, integrity is actually a key value of mine. So it's not surprising it ended up in the book and in my work, right? I think integrity is incredibly important. Um, and being integrous is important. So, and I, as you were saying that, I was remembering that I have the word design integrity is a phase, you know, integration is the final main phase in the process. So the idea of, you know, literally integrating things, disintegrating, is, you know, as part of it, when we are changing, we know we disintegrate you know and then there's this value of integrity how are we are we doing what we say we're going to do right what are the psychological contracts which i know you you talk a lot about pat in the organization i think following through are those are a form of integrity um you know how do we if we make a promise are we keeping it so there's a lot of aspects of integrity i think from a practical functional level and a, a values based level that show up throughout the book i don't um the book was reviewed uh on a site called Blog Critics, which I was really grateful for. And one of the things the reviewer talked about was that a theme throughout the book was the importance of psychological safety. And I agree that you, you can't have a great culture if you don't have a reasonably safe, trusting environment for people to be in. Uh, after that, I think your culture is gonna evolve and emerge however it is, it is meant to over time, right? And you're anticipating change or adapting to change that's gonna change your culture. But if you don't have that level of integrity and safety, you cannot, absolutely cannot have a functional culture. It's, it's not going to happen. Well, you know, let, as I go through the book and, you know, rereading the book to chat with you today, yeah. there are a number of things that I'm really struck by uh, that I just kind of blew a little bit, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and that is that the level of engagement by which you recommend slash or do when you are working with organizations, mm -hmm. you know, the worst thing you could ever do in an organization, Claudette, and you know this, you and I have talked about it is mm -hmm. put it, put a culture, put an organization through a series of assessments. Tell mm -hmm. us what you think, how are we doing? And mm -hmm. then absolutely do nothing with it. Right. Right. That is, I mean, you and I could talk story about that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But what you've done in mm -hmm. cultural brilliance is where most cultural ideas, work, efforts, projects, consults, ends, you continue and build within the cultural brilliance system mm -hmm. the very nature of how to improve the general feeling in an organization. And I say feeling, but it's measured this fancy term climate. You ask people, how are you doing? Do you like mm -hmm. your job? Do you like your workplace? But in what you've developed, because of the way you talk about it, mm -hmm. by the very nature of what you're presenting, people and engagement and involvement and being part of the change is what mm -hmm. you've built in. Mm -hmm. 
Why is that one of the most important concepts, perhaps, that you've identified here? Well, I think, you know, people, as we've talked about, people are are the culture, right? They're driving the culture all day long, in addition to the, you know, there it's, iter- I think of culture as iterative, um, just like a change is iterative. And that is, you know, another idea in the book. So if you don't have people involved, it's like you're trying to change a system without having the system being part of the change. I don't know how else to say it. You're, you know, here a system, you must change. Let us tell you how to do it. And the system's saying, we're going to do whatever we want because we already have a behavioral pattern. So if you want your system to change, you've got to get the people in the system involved, um, sharing their feedback and and being part of it. And what I find is they have the best ideas. They know things nobody else, the leaders don't know, and not because the leaders aren't great, but because leaders cannot see everything. They're not in everybody else's day-to-day, and they're only in their own day-to-day. So people come up with these amazing ideas. They come up with lots of innovations. Um, and one thing that's really striking me is in what you were saying, that that I wanted to mention is around the feeling piece is it's interesting that sometimes in organizations, even when the changes are happening, we're at a point where there are a lot of positive changes happening, things people wanted to see change that's actually occurring, right? Sometimes people take a while to feel better. It's interesting. Some people will feel better, but their old ways of feeling, which is this isn't working or, oh, we're really worried things are going to slide back again, you know, which is a human concern that sometimes it takes a while for the positive feeling to sync with what's actually changing, which has been a really interesting observation for me. Yeah, not yeah. only is it interesting, but here yeah. I want to get to something in the book. Uh, yeah. For those just tuning in, Claudette Rowley, the author of a phenomenal book, Cultural Brilliance. Thanks. Uh, look, here's what you say. I love this because, you know, as I've read countless amount of books on organizational dynamics leadership, mm-hmm. none of them really get to this issue at fundamental part of the system you're talking about. Mm-hmm. You call it the adaptogen conversation. So you see, the reason I like this, mm-hmm. is because you're not talking about like an adaptogen as if it was something, I wonder if Benny's got that sound bite, uh, the adaptogen conversations as if it, you're, it, it's some kind of out of body experience, right? Mm-hmm. Here's what you say. You say, as we know, brilliant cultures proactively this change in ways that decrease stress, inspire learning, and promote organizational health. Mm -hmm. See, that sentence right there, that's a brilliant statement. Mm -hmm. You go on to say is, this is what we need to do to teach folks, right? Mentor folks on how to engage in an adaptive conversation. Mm -hmm. Tell us what that looks like. (laughs) <laughs> so that is, yeah, the definition of a brilliant culture, right, technically, that it, it adapts, it is adapting to change, responding to change, right, in, in the, as you said, in ways that decrease stress. And I think that's a really important part because change, as we know, is often responded to with stress. So how do we learn to adapt to change as an opportunity? And that's a whole skill set where, you know, and part of that is that we say, hey, what's the opportunity here? What can we learn from this? So it changes the entire conversation around change and around culture. Um, the adaptation conversations were designed to help people, especially once a lot of cultural change had happened, main t- ma- not only maintain the change, but continue the evolution, right? This process is, is iterative because it's culture and it's a system. Whether you can see it or not, your culture evolves every day in either ways you want it to or you may not want it to. Um, but the adaptation conversations are conversations that take place at three levels, which are the head, heart, and the energetic level. And so... A lot in a lot of organizations, we'll see you know the head conversation, which is data, information, things like that, analysis, which is really important and is, has to be part of any conversation. But and some organizations will add in what I call the heart conversation, which is more of the you know intuition. Um, what are we noticing? What are we feeling? Right? How is this impacting people? And then, but not many organizations add in the energy conversation, which is what's emerging. What do we notice that's emerging? Right. What does it even feel like to be in this room and to be with each other? There's a whole energetic component. What's the collective wisdom? What's the cultural intelligence? And when you get people in that conversation, that third conversation, now you're looking at whatever problem you have in front of you in a completely different way. So it's, and that's a part of that, a key part of that adaptogen conversation. That's how an organization can iterate. uh, I use this idea of an upward spiral with change as opposed to using change as a not using it, but having change impact them in a downward spiral kind of a way. Mm. 
Um, you know, Claudette, today is a pivotal day. I mean, uh -huh. it is a day that we're talking about the book of you just tuning in. You know, I love how amazing this is. For those of you out there, this is what I want to say about the book. You know, as you're listening to the show and you're thinking, wow, what can I do? How can we enhance the workplace? Here's what I've learned at working my way up from <clears throat> being a clerk in a mailroom <clears throat> to being an executive uh, in a Fortune 100 company. Here's what I've learned. Nine times out of 10, you know, we were at the grassroots level in an organization finding books finding things that we would gather and collect and hand off or send copies to our folks in HR or folks in the leadership team or folks in the project team, right? This is what we did. So what I want to say to folks listening, if you're thinking, well, wait a minute, I'm not an executive. Well, this book isn't a book just for executives. It's for mm -hmm. everyone. Mm -hmm. And so if anything we're talking about in your organization needs a resolution, I'd like to encourage you to get a copy of this book, one for yourself and one for your boss. And what you can do is open up the dialogue. <clears throat> because I think for me, the many times I've seen change in my long career in, in corporations and as a consultant is when an employee walks up and hands you a book and says, I think this book can help our team. Mm -hmm. And I, I, that's what I love about this book because you didn't write this book for somebody that has to have a PhD in organizational something or other. Mm -hmm. This book is written in a way that it's practical, it's powerful, it's mm -hmm. eventful, and it's a blueprint to follow. Mm -hmm. Was that your intention? Absolutely, it was my intention. I wanted the book to be accessible. I wanted the book to be something that someone could take and, and actually use. So not just a set of ideas that, you know, someone would read and say that, wow, this is really, but I have absolutely no idea what to do with this, right? I wanted people to say, I could take this and try, try this out or try out part of it in my organization. So it was my, always my intention that it was a usable book, a blueprint. Definitely. Okay. I want to ask you this. Let's mm -hmm. talk about the vision. For okay. cultural brilliance. Of course, we've talked about the book, but I want to talk about cultural brilliance now mm -hmm. and your commitment to literally create a permanent, lasting, positive change. Because this mm -hmm. is a book of positive change. Definitely. Um, mm -hmm. And I want to ask you, where does the vision take us mm -hmm. from your perspective? Of course, today is the first day, the book launch. Mm -hmm. But tell me from your perspective where the vision could take us. And and why is it so important for people at all levels to take a look at what they can do differently, to have a vision, in, in a sense, for themselves? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think for me, my vision for cultural brilliance is, in a, it's what you read about, how business, you know, business can really change the world. Um, and so I see, you know, I think about it, all different sorts of organizations and businesses, and if they had cultures that were that really source the potential that's in the organization they would be making different decisions they would be maybe they'd be making the same products maybe they'd be making different ones i don't know um, but they would be doing something different in a way that really contributed to the world even more than they probably already are um, they you know so and everybody in the organization would have more of a voice right they'd have more power so you have these people who are more empowered more developed people into the world and do other things. So to me, it's a very, it's a very cumulative kind of effect. Um, and I, you know, I, I used to be a social worker, right? So I have a master's in social work as my first career. And I always, you know, when people would say, why do you want to do that? I'm like, I, you know, I'm a change the world kind of person. I have to contribute. And that is absolutely part of this for me at a personal level is I, I needed to add something that was a contribution. Um, so that's part of the vision. But I think anytime anybody in a, anybody, whether any kind of organization you're a part of, gets more empowered, feels like they can have a voice, they've changed. And I believe in that ripple in the pond effect. So, you know, you cannot, you cannot change your culture if you do not give people a voice. It's not going to work. It absolutely will not work. Tell us about the culture. Tell us about the whisperer. Oh, the culture whisperer. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's, I, I have two chapters on leadership at the back of the book, but anybody can be a culture whisperer and anybody can use ideas in those two chapters. 
But it's really about, it's about someone who starts to understand their culture in, in a was kind of like a horse whisper, right? Or a dog whisper really just starts to tune in and understand the culture in a, in a different way, in a nuanced way where they're noticing the energy of it. They're noticing when something might shift might be that all of a sudden there's a bunch of tension in the organization or on a team and you have no idea where it came from. It seems like it's out of nowhere, but of course it never really is out of nowhere. But that culture whisperer might notice in advance that, gee, there seems to be a little bit of tension emerging, but I'm not sure what's happening. Maybe we should start checking in versus just responding to the, you know, two people who suddenly had a blow up in the conference room, right? An argument. Um, and now you're just responding and wondering what happened and figuring out what to do and how do you handle what happened between these two people. So the whisperer is, um, is someone who's really tuned into the nuance of the culture. Yeah. I mean, and that's really, it used to be called open but we've gone yes. so far down the rabbit hole with the organizational dynamics and layers and layers and layers that have been created over the past, I'd say, 15 years, really. I mean, this did not happen overnight. But right. in order for us to be out in front in innovation in things that we do, we must get back to becoming brilliant cultures. Mm -hmm. We must do that or we're Absolutely. not going to be able to compete. Well, absolutely. And when you have you have your your organization and the people in it spending maybe fifty percent of their time dealing with pol internal politics and other dynamics, you've lost a ton of potential, innovation, focus, productivity. It, it, the math is pretty simple on it. So I agree. Yeah, brilliant cultures. Um, even starting the cultural brilliance process, I noticed change because people get some hope. The light comes back on in their eyes, and they think, "Oh, this is really interesting. Maybe something could change." And oh. yeah, and that's huge right there. Well, I, gotta tell you, I want to thank you so much for being here. Much congratulations to you. Thank you really, so much. Man, Thanks for having me. It's yeah. I got to tell you for me personally, it's been a pivotal part of my career to be able to take this journey with you. Oh, thank and, you. And literally watch how somebody takes an idea, mm -hmm. which becomes a vision that's fueled by a dream Mm -hmm. puts one foot in front of the other, is willing to take risks, challenge oneself, and mm -hmm. then create the fantastic body of work that mm -hmm. fuels your passion and purpose for a better world. Mm -hmm. Thank you for doing that. Oh, thank you, Dr. Pat. Thanks so much. Thank you uh, for your partnership in this. Yeah. What at Rally, everybody. Go to the website, culturalbrilliance.com, Amazon. You can get the book, but you could get the book at Claudette's website. Mm -hmm. Let's rock on. And for those of you out there, get the T-shirt. Well, I don't know. Maybe we need a T-shirt. Yeah. I'm an adaptogen. There we go. <laughs> we'll be right back, everybody. Cool. All clear. Thank Great. you, Claudette. You've been listening to the hit show, Cultural Brilliance Radio, the DNA of organizational excellence with Claudette Rowley. Conversations that are transforming the world of culture and business. You can download this podcast and find out more about Claudette and her breakthrough work at ClaudetteRowley.com. Please contact Claudette and find out how you can create a brilliant culture.